Hey, good morning, Chad. Morning. Thanks for joining it. Let's give it another one or two minutes and see if more folks join and we can get started. All right, I think we can get started. Some more folks uh, join and we'll let them join later. <laughs> yeah, so thanks for joining and yeah, happy to learn about the Temporal Project. Uh, myself, I, I'm interested in Temporal Project because um, uh, we currently use it where we work at. So um that's my initial interest but uh, i think it would be interesting for other folks to hear um what the project does and also the roadmap or things that, that they're thinking about doing in the future uh, yeah okay yeah give me just a second let me share my screen and we can go over all that give me just a second here uh, let me see if I can figure out how best to do this. Let's see here. Give me just a second. There we go. All right. And so what I did is I just made a little short, took me about 10 minutes to write presentation. So what um, the reason I'm presenting is because I wrote a lot of the code and I figured that is much better for the audience, even though it's only two of us or three of us. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll just do a quick overview of what Temporal is, and then we can just get into the questions. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So, um, and yeah, and that's why I put like warning, this is, you know, engineering type of just quick bullets. It's not we have a whole marketing team, so we're well-funded. We have a whole marketing team and, and developer relations team and such, but I figure I can be best at answering those deep technical questions. So what is Temporal? Temporal is basically, the, in a nutshell, it's the ability to write long-lived, resilient workflows in a programming language of your choice. Just about any developer that's spent any time developing has had to write some form of workflow. We've all used a million tools. Temporal just solves it by allowing you to write it in a programming language instead of ending up with Turing complete seeming YAMLs and such, right? So workflows are in your programming language. They have to be deterministic so that they can be replayed in other workers and can be uh, resilient. They can run for years. There's no real time limit on any workflow. They have very reliable error and retry semantics. Um, and workflows can call out to what we call activities that can invoke anything that can do essentially anything you want and are not constrained by determinism like workflows are. Uh, we have a full-blown server that uh, it maintains all the events, but all of the actual workflow and activity code runs on the user side on the worker. And it, it basically uses event sourcing um, to accomplish this. And we'll get that, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, we support, for this reason, we support end-to-end -end encryption, of course, because we don't run the user code. 
the developer runs the user code. Uh, we have SDKs for Go, JVM, Node.js, Python, .NET, PHP, and even Ruby and Rust coming. And all of these are pretty complex projects. So let's uh, get, uh, get on to what the project is itself. So we're very well funded. Um, uh, last year announced a 100 million round, a 75 million round uh, fund was announced um, uh, a couple of months ago, even in this climate. So that's pretty good. A lot of people are, are using this and counting on this. So uh, many, many companies you've probably heard of and probably yourselves too. Uh, our founders have built, so you may recognize some of the concepts. Our founders have built this at several different companies before in order to get to kind of where we are now, different different things like Azure Functions or Amazon Simple Workflow and stuff. That was also built by our founders and it's basically coalesced to, to this type of product. So it was originally uh, Uber Cadence and we had forked from that a couple of years ago, but have significantly grown since. So it's an MIT based server, um, MIT licensed server that has multiple database options, standard Postgres, MySQL, even SQLite and such. And then all of the SDKs and all the different languages are also MIT licensed. And uh, where, our, where we make our money is on the cloud offering, but it's by no means required. A lot of people use the only open source form of it. So what are temporal workflows? Temporal workflows are essentially what temporal is, the part of temporal. You can use your normal programming language, you know, your fours and your loops and everything, uh, you know, your exception semantics um, to write workflows, which makes them much more maintainable than a lot of workflow systems that don't use code. And it's not emulated or interpreted or anything like that. It is literally running the code. And we translate the results of the code into commands to the server and the server sends back events. And we and that's how we can replay them in order so long as you maintain deterministic execution in the workflow. So um, the, yeah, we've, we've all worked with these workflow things in the past. So the workflows do have to be deterministic. So you can't call out to IO. If you need to, what you do is you invoke an activity and that can do, of course, whatever you want. Same type of deal with concurrency in a lot of languages. If it's not deterministic, i.e. Uh, predictable pattern, predictable code path with the same effects, you can't do it. And different SDKs and language runtimes prevent different challenges on uh, how we can restrain that and constrain that. Um, but a workflow can run for a long time. All of its history is visible inside of our UI. Uh, it, you know, if, if a worker crashes, it doesn't matter. These are self-contained, isolated, deterministic things that just replay to get to the point to where they uh, were last left off on the next worker. Um, there are, we have all sorts of advanced features from testing to debugging and replaying and all these other things but I won't get too much into them. Our website explains all of this much better than I can. I'm just giving the super high level. And then real quick, and then I'll be done. Um, we have different SDKs for different languages and these run the actual user code. So we have the Go SDK, which was our original SDK and what, uh, did come over from Uber, but we've improved it since. Um, things like Go routines and getting the current time and you know crypto RAND and un otherwise unseated RAND, you can't really, uh, Use inside of a workflow. So we have used, we wrote our own equivalents, um, essentially our own coroutine system with channels and, and go routines and such that are deterministic and therefore can be used by users. Um, the JVM, we did a similar thing. Obviously, you can't use threads or, or system time or system IO. And we wrote our own coroutine based system in there. That one also was originally forked from Uber or uh, from Cadence, but we have improved it a lot since. And then all of our other SDKs are uh, unique to temporal uh, TypeScript. So what we ended up doing is, is we recognize that these state machines inside these SDKs are incredibly complicated to write um, and maintain. Uh, they're not just, these aren't just thin client wrappers. So we wrote um, the core of the, of the logic in Rust, and then we're using it from several of these other languages, such as... Um, so the TypeScript SDK, which is really just Node.js SDK. Um, Node.js SDK is- uh, No worries, no worries. Uh, some extra noise, so <laughs> you can go ahead. Okay. The TypeScript SDK is backed by uh, Rust Core, um, and it, it actually ensures deterministic execution by putting things in a V8 sandbox, so it, uh, it's very nice in that way, and we use JS promises that are all deterministic anyway. So it actually fits that language very well. 
Um, I wrote the Python SDK, also backed by Rust Core, um, and we had to custom write a sandbox to help keep determinism in there. And we get to use async IO natively, so we're um, so it also looks very much like basic async Python. So you can wait to sleep, and we of course start a durable temporal timer. We don't sleep locally. Um, .NET, a uh, similar type of deal. It's backed by the same Rust core. Um, I also have just written this one. Um, it is still in alpha, but it uses uh, the task scheduler for deterministic concurrency. It has its own challenges. I won't really get into all those unless there are questions for me. And then PHP is actually um, maintained by another, another company, but does uh, but is supported by Temporal, and it sits on the Go SDK that uses Roadrunner, so it's not necessarily a pure PHP solution. And then there's a, a Rust and Ruby um, Ruby plans for the future, and that is basically it. So I can get into any of the details about any of the languages, or I can just explain stuff at a high level. But um, yeah, I wrote a lot of the code, and my peers have written a lot of the code, so I can I can answer just about anything. Yeah, one question. And, about and the reason that. that's why I kept the presentation kind of brief there is just because there's so much information available on our website and it is very open that there's probably not a whole lot of value in me doing the default marketing pitch for y'all who are already fairly engineer driven. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, one question that I have about the temporal workers. Uh, do they actually keep state uh, only, or do they actually do some sort of like uh, execution? So that's- um, well, It depends on what you mean by state. It depends on what you mean by state. So um, no and yes. So let's say you're writing a workflow and it pick a programming language and um, you have a local variable in there and maybe you executed an activity or set it to some value after a timer. We don't store that local variable inside of the temporal server. So if it runs on another worker, it just replays all the steps to rebuild that local variable. That's in a very event sourced type of manner. That's why it has to be deterministic is because it can run anywhere and rebuild its state anywhere. Having said that, we do have optimizations to cache existing runs that are, that are not finished yet um, inside of the worker, but that's just an optimization. It's, it's not required. Got it. And that, and that's it. I mean, it, you cache it in also, uh, in case something happens, then, um, well, let's say that worker actually goes down the, mm -hmm. the, that, uh, that that's also the optimization is kept some, or cache kept somewhere else so that it can actually be replayed. Mm -hmm. No, that's purely an optimization. You can disable the cache and it won't affect the run at all. The Again, these workflows are um, uh, essentially just sets of commands and events. When you do stuff, we send commands to the server. When the server sends events, we apply them to the workflow. Since it's deterministic, we have this full set of events. So if your worker crashes and another worker, come, uh, another worker needs to take the work, it doesn't need to have any information. It just receives the set of events and it has your code and it runs the events through them, matching up the commands with the events. And then you're immediately where you left off again. So it's done via replay in an event source manner. So maybe let's see if I can give a hypothetical to make more sense. So let's say you have a workflow and you've run like 20 activities, stored some local variables, blah, blah, blah. And then your worker crashes. Well, we have all that information in history, what you've run, where you are at, blah, blah, blah. The next worker picks it up. It goes right past the pieces that it's already done. It's essentially memoized from a programming perspective. And so all of those things where you executed an activity 20 times, we already populate the result for those. And then it's ready for the 21st time, if you will. Oh, okay. So is that state actually kept in the, the backend, like the MySQL or Cassandra database? Yes. That is the purpose of the server is to orchestrate these events, the primary purpose. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Um, so, um, when a workflow actually gets instantiated, the what worker picks it up? Is just it, any random worker, or is it like? Yeah. Uh, okay. So we don't have advanced. Uh, we don't currently, though. We're uh, though there are different projects underway for that. We don't currently have advanced uh, work distribution mechanisms. 
But we do have task queues that users can choose in order to set up their own work distribution mechanisms. But essentially a worker is just a, a, it's, it's a, it's a daemon that's basically asking the server for work to do and on a certain task queue. So if there's five uh, workers for a certain task queue for HA or even load balancing reasons, any one of those could receive that workflow and then start the running of it. And then the optimization is that that one's cached and events go to that. But if that worker crashes, it doesn't matter. Um, worker crash just doesn't matter as far as temporal is concerned, as far as temporal workflows are concerned. It is totally resilient to that. Got it. Thanks. Anybody else has any other questions? So, um, so Tap, thank you for the presentation. I may have a question about the SDKs, it's just out of curiosity. Um, you mentioned like several of those SDKs, like TypeScript, I think I remember, um, I think I, I just kept the name of TypeScript. They are Rust baked or based on the on the core um, Rust core that you mentioned. But mm -hmm. I'm curious because there are there are several SDKs that are based on Rust, but you are working on a Rust SDK. So is that kind of, why is, is that? Why is not the, the Rust SDK yet? Um, so the rest, uh, so we choose our SDKs uh, based on need and desire, and the need and desire for the Rust SDK was is was much lower than the rest of these. Um, but you know that's starting to change as the Rust mm -hmm. ecosystem changes. Something being backed by the Rust core, the Rust core is an internal piece of shared. I mean, it's all open source MIT license, of course. But Rust core is an internal piece of shared code across these SDKs. A Rust SDK is Rust-based sugar on top of that. So, for instance, if you're familiar with Rust, um, you understand that there's uh, there's futures, and you essentially choose how to run those uh, futures. You can, you know, the way that the that Tokyo or Async STD would do it. We have to write our own deterministic version of that. We have to write what our own shape of workflows would look like and so on and so forth, as opposed to the Rust core, which essentially um, is more about getting commands and state machine right and communicating over gRPC with the server and all of those pieces. So they're wholly separate. Of course, the Rust SDK will also use the Rust core and be statically linked as just a crate reference, but um, it's, it's our SDKs that are available are all about need and, and desire. And so that's why the Rust one hasn't been developed yet, but it will be. Okay, okay. Thank you for the, for the explanation. Um, um, maybe a follow-up question is, um, I think you mentioned like a static library, so I guess that's the mechanism, but how those kind of different languages like TypeScript, Python, and .NET reuse that Rust library? What's the mechanism that is behind that? Sure. So um, using so if you're familiar with Rust, uh, you know that it actually can speak CFFI pretty well. And use okay. uh, and if you're willing to you know delve into the us unsafe world into the Rust of the, <laughs> the world, it has it, it has no problem doing that. I can tell you for each individually how it works. So uh, for TypeScript, it is deployed as a shared library, of course, not a static library, and it uses the Rust project called Neon, which helps bridge that gap. And basically, anybody writing Node.js extensions in Rust use Neon these days. It's uh, it, it's very helpful for getting a lot of the V8 stuff right. The uh, the Python one uses a very popular project called Pio3 and Pio3 Async.io, okay. which also bridges that boundary um, and does it fairly well. It captures the GIO when it needs to and things like that. Um, the .NET one has no good Rust bridge at this moment. So I literally expose a C API from the Rust core and then, you know, built a header and then I use P invoke. Uh, to uh, invoke that. So, um, and they're all DLLs for the use of these because there is no static link. Well, they're static linking with uh, .NET, but in our case, we don't use it we use, because managed DLLs are not the same as normal DLLs and it's a whole thing. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Makes sense. Sure. Yeah, and happy to answer all sorts of questions. <laughs> questions like these. Yeah. Another question I have about the temporal services, there, there are multiple services that there's a, or, or types of servers. There's a historical, mm -hmm. there's just like a front end. I think there's another yeah. one. Can, can you actually talk about what they actually do? I probably can't. And that's the one place where it's probably not the best for me to answer. I mean, it'd probably be better to defer to our server team and our docs. So the different services do uh, are in, internal services that communicate with each other 
whereas the, the outside world only communicates with the front end service. I'm probably not the best to, I mean, I can give kind of overviews, but I'm not the best to answer the internal service to service logic of the server. Okay. I have to delegate, but hop on our, hop on our Slack and ask them or look at our docs and there'll be lots of people willing to answer that. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. So the, so basically you only talk to the front end uh, service and, and then yeah, the, so services talk to each other. Or? Yeah. The services talk to each other. The fact that they are multiple services is almost an internal implementation detail. Nobody, uh, uh, I mean, you can, you, you use that implementation detail if you're deploying your own open source server and want to scale because they scale in different ways, but in general, no, only the, uh, the, the outside world only knows of this, of the front end service. So that's the actual piece that's exposed that there's internal services, uh, is an implementation detail for the most part. Got it. Got it. Did you, did you have, uh, Oh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but like you have any recommendations on number of workflows and, and uh, scaling numbers? So like how many, so say like you run the portal on Kubernetes, like how many pods you need and or, or what type of, what type of backends are preferred, like uh, the MySQL backend or the Cassandra backend or? So um, we have entire operations guides and, and, and assistance on those. So I, you can't really get one sentence answers. Um, and it depends on whether you're talking about running the server or the workers. Um, the servers have a fairly um, known uh, scale constraint, except for the storage side. There's no recommended, um, there's probably no recommended persistence, but it's probably Cassandra. I would defer to an operations side on that. From the workers' perspective, we have an entire worker tuning guide that can help you decide, you know, how many pods, how many work, how many workflows to, to, because everybody's workflow and activity shape is so different that you can't just blindly say, you know, 10 work, uh, you know, 10 million workflows need this many uh, pods. Or if you want to run a thousand a second, you need this. There's there's tuning guides and operation guides that are very, that end up being unique to everybody's use case because it's your code. So only you can benchmark what you need. Got it, got it. Uh, a different topic. Uh, this project was actually forked off uh, Cadence from Uber, right? And right. Is, is the Cadence project still happening, or that's not actually being? Yeah. Or yeah, the founders, the the, the original uh, builders of Cadence are our founders, and they've done this uh, multiple times before. But from what I gather, and I don't look very closely, so I wouldn't be a good one to ask. Uh, yeah, seems like it's uh, it's still going. They don't have all the SDKs we do, and there's. And we have some uh, features we've added since, but uh, it does seem like that project's still going. But I don't, I don't know. I don't really look at it. Got it. Did you? Uh, and as far as the community, I don't know if you can answer some of these questions. But uh, is the temporal organization the only maintainer, or are there are multiple maintainers for the for the project? So you... I mean. I guess I'm not, I guess I don't understand the question exactly, but there's not really like a temporal foundation built up by multiple companies. It, it is right, right. temporal open source project is owned and built and maintained by temporal the company. However, it's MIT license contributions welcome, then we get contributions all the time. Got it, got it. Uh, but there's no like um I guess effort to actually involve more community members to contribute, right? So Oh, absolutely. We always encourage community members to contribute. And it's always an active effort. We have we even have our own conference and, and entire developer relations groups that are uh, that are focused on uh, encouraging such contributions. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. So if, if any any uh, interest in in uh, working with the CNCF, uh, you know, we, I think we'd be happy to work with the uh, with the project and. Uh, with, I'd have to, I'd delegate that to the business. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. That's really all I can say there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, so I made myself available as an engineer for like the engineering questions, but that's that's where you get into uh, business relationships. And yeah, makes sense. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we have, Heba, do you have any other questions? I think you see you on the, on the call. I don't know if you have any. 
Yeah, sorry for joining a little bit late, but uh, no, so far I will I will have a look and I will just uh, you know like I will definitely get back to you, uh, and we can ascend uh, after the meeting. Sounds good. Well. All right. Well, um, I stopped sharing the um, the temporal Slack is very public and very active. Um, feel free to ask any questions there. Same with the temporal forums, also public and quite active, and we're very responsive. Awesome. Yeah, and yeah, it's, maybe you can share that uh, Slack link on the. So at the, I see that you joined the the Tag Run Time channel. So, so yep. you can share that over there. Then other folks interested in can just join the. Sure. The and Slack beyond and just the Slack and forum links. Every link to anything about Temporal is available from Temporal's website, of course. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining. Um, and I hope to see you around. All right. Thank you all very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank Jeff. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.